Mitch Altman. Hey, everyone. <clears throat> you know, my name is Mitch, and um, different people know me for different things, but I probably am most well known for creating a keychain that turns TVs off in public places, TV Be Gone. Um, it sort of uh, propelled me into the life I'm leading now. Uh, but I also um, started NoiseBridge, a hackerspace in San Francisco, uh, co helped co-found that with uh, other people. And I go around the world promoting hackerspaces and community, and everywhere I go I teach people how to solder and make cool things with electronics. So, um, uh, amongst other things. So, um, but uh, I consider myself a hacker. And hacking is, uh, means different things for different people, but uh, I am a hacker, in particular a hardware hacker, uh, but mostly a hacker. I hack. And um, for me, hacking means seeing the way things are, doing what I love, really, and seeing the way things are, improving upon it uh, as best I can, and then sharing it as best I can. And I think that uh, overlaps with what most of us here in the open source community do. Um, we do what we love, improve upon what we do, and share it as best as we can, and thus improving not only our lives, but the lives of people around us. So uh, that's how we can all uh, make the world a better place. But um, you know, it's, it's software, it's hardware, it's hacking our communities, it's hacking the world. We can hack the planet together. Um, and this is all, as I see it, part of a broader community of free culture. Uh, free culture, hacker spaces, open source hardware, open source software, whatever, it all comes together as one big community uh, that uh, whether we are um, purposely doing it or not is supporting one, uh, all of it supports itself uh, together. Um, so this conference says right on the website that our goal is to promote, promote the use of open source software. Um, and I'm a hardware hacker. And I was invited to give this talk here, which to me is an indication that uh, this really is getting much, much bigger than any of us have ever planned. But it's through community that all of this happens. Um, open source software is actually really new in the scheme of things. But it's through community that it's gotten so huge as it's gotten in such a short amount of time. And on the heels of that, uh, me and a lot of other people, uh, I, I just sort of help whenever I can, uh, created open source hardware uh, on the heels of open source software and what we've learned from all of that. And in a very short amount of time with community, um, created version 1.0 definition of open source hardware, which we created as very open. Uh, basically, uh, all documentation should be online, no restrictions, and um, you must share alike. So it must be uh, shared as open source hardware. And the, you, the only restriction can be if you want to have attribution. It's only fair that people give credit where credit's due. So um, uh, let's see. So. Um, you know, this talk is, is uh, about community, but uh, it's really, for me, um, about hacking uh, community to make our lives better. Um, you know, uh, I'll, uh, I'll get into this in a sec, but, um, you know, to me, hardware, software, hackerspaces, anything we do is really just an excuse for community, which we all need. Um, but along the way, we can learn a lot and uh, improve our lives as a result of what we learn together in community. Uh, but we, we see through our involvement uh, with the open source uh, community, with free culture community, with hackerspaces, whatever, uh, that there are ways things have been and have been for quite a long time. And we're brought up in a culture of this old paradigm where uh, without thinking about it, we might go along and do things like the normal way, which I did when I first did TV Be Gone. Uh, we create whatever we create, be it uh, a quilt 
a piece of software, uh, a new means for manufacturing a product, uh, music, uh, whatever, and then we protect it from the rest of the world out there that wants to take it from us. And we say, don't come near this thing or I will sue your ass. So that's worked. That's been successful for some definition of success for quite a long time. Um, and so it persists because of that. But along the way, it really does stifle creativity and innovation uh, because we're not allowed to take what we can learn from these other things legally, and so we have to do it in an underground way if we do it at all. Whereas what we're creating with open source, with free culture, is saying, I created this really cool thing, check it out, it's really cool, here's how I did it. I put it online, I talk to people, I'm enthusiastic, I share my enthusiasm. Other people share that enthusiasm, it, it can take off like wildfire, and a lot of people can learn about it. And when people have questions, we tell people how to, uh, you know, we answer people's questions so they can uh, do more with it, and it spreads, and people can use those ideas to do other cool things. And that is the new, paradigm that we see growing like crazy right now. We are just the very beginning of all this. All of us are contributing to it in our own ways, whether we're just interested in it or whether we're developers or whether we're actually going out and talking, whatever. We're all part of this at the beginning and setting the scene for what's to come. So, and this encourages innovation and creativity. So it spreads like crazy. But even though we give our stuff away freely, does not mean that we can't make money on it. Indeed, we can. We can supplement our income or even make a living off of these open source projects that we love. And I hope more and more people do that. TV Be Gone, even though I started as uh, the normal route, because open source hardware really didn't exist uh, as such in 2003. But by doing this and coming across the open source community at hacker conferences that I went to, because of this, I was invited to them, um, it got me to really rethink all of that. And I was not fully enamored with patents to begin with. But uh, I made TV Be Gone open source because I got so much from the open source community because people were so enthusiastic about this that they shared their ideas with me, which improved upon my project, which I can then share with the world. I'm only one person. I can only do so much. But with some of the most intelligent, creative, wonderful engineers on the planet, um, who I didn't even know, and still don't know in many ways, um, they help improve my product, which I can then share with the rest of the world. Um, but I make a living off of TV Be Gone. It's the only way I make money. And I've been doing this since 2004. Um, so it is possible to make a living off of a project that you love. I just made one for me, and when it turned out other people wanted it, I thought, well, you know, I kind of know how to do manufacturing. Maybe I can actually manufacture my own thing and see how it goes. And, uh, you know, I did okay enough with it, and uh, it turned out enough people wanted it. I've sold 260,000 of these things which is pretty amazing. That's a lot of people going around the world turning TVs off and enjoying it and making the world a better place for everyone in the process. So, uh, but I am not the only one who uh, makes a living doing projects that they love, open source projects that they love. My friend Nina, Nina Paley, uh, let's see, there's a sticker here. Here, this is Sita. She made, she took five years of her life to make a feature-length animated film. That's a lot of time and effort. She only did it because she loved it, and she freely gives it away. Anyone can go online and get a full resolution copy just free for the download on her website. And yet she makes a living from it because people buy her DVDs. She has little special perks when people buy DVDs, like with artwork and signed copies, and she also sells little pins with her characters, uh, as well as giving away stickers, and occasionally a special edition uh, uh, drinking mug with Sita characters on it, uh, whatever. And also, people just give her money because they think what she's doing is really cool, um, which is kind of cool. You know, if you normally if you have a for-profit company like I have, people don't donate money or time to you, and people donate money and time to me or to Nina. And um, there's an, another friend of mine, uh, Lamore Freed, uh, also known as Lady Ada. 
uh, who runs Adafruit Industries. Um, she makes really amazing open source kits that she creates for teaching beginners how to make cool things. Documentation for everything on every aspect of the project is online. Anyone can download all that for free. And she makes a living doing this. And she's done so well that she is on the cover of the most recent Wired magazine doing a, uh, a Rosie the River kind of pose. Uh, it's awesome. You know, it's the first time that a woman engineer has been on the cover of Wired magazine in all this time. She did that. And she's an inspiration to me and so many other people. Uh, including my friend Jimmy Rogers, who makes lots of cool kits uh, that are all open source that he sells and makes a living on. Um, there's also MakerBot, which is a, a company that makes 3D printers. I'll talk a little bit more about them later. They now have you know, a pretty decent sized small company that's paying a whole small army of people uh, to make stuff that they all love. It's really wonderful to do that, and I would encourage more people to do that. Um, how many people in this room uh, make money uh, doing open source projects that they love? One. I would love to see that increase to way, way more, because you know the thing is, too many of us feel trapped in a job that we don't like. And um, it doesn't have to be that way. <laughs> How many people do you think don't like their work in our country? I've done this in lots of uh, talks already, so maybe you've already heard that. But the answer is actually 80%, according to the internet, which is the fount of all truth. Um, so uh, I looked that up before I said that the first time in a talk. And uh, yeah, 80%, that sucks. And it's really, really sad because, you know, we spend a third of our lives at work. If we don't like a third of our lives, the other third of our lives that we spend sleeping is dreaming about that life we don't like. That's two-thirds of our life. And then if you take the other third to watch TV, just to chill out from those two-thirds you don't like, then when have you ever had a chance to actually explore a life that might have some fulfillment? So the thing is, we can. We can choose to do something else. But uh, for the record, my name is Mitch Altman. I turn TVs off for a living, and I love my job. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> and you can, too. Because um, the thing is, I didn't start off being someone who's confident in what I do, sharing what I know, um, helping other people. I grew up being brutally bullied for being an introverted geek and for being weird and intellectual and, and gay and fad and all these things that I was as a little kid and in many ways still am. I've lost a lot of weight, but um, you know, the thing is, being a geek when I was a little kid was very dangerous. I could not pass as someone who was not a geek. And I was very much brutally bullied. I took it upon myself and blamed myself. I hated myself. I um, uh, had low self-esteem, to say the least. And yet, through choices that I've made in my life, more consciously later in my life, I've grown to be um, you know, uh, uh, a jet-setting, public-speaking, crazy-haired weirdo inventor who loves what I do. And I'm capable of sharing it with other people to the best of my ability. And you know, really, if I could make that path from total depressed blob of a kid to who I am now being happy, you know, happiness is different for everyone. But if I can make that journey, anyone can, seriously, because, you know, I I never would have thought it was possible for me, but you know, this happens because of um, the choices I make and the ideas that come across uh, as I live my life. And you know, we all have ideas, all of us. Not all of us follow through with them, because there are so many things in our day-to-day -day life that get in the way of that. But you know, you've had ideas, you have had ideas, and some of them like gnaw away in the back of your mind and just persist, no matter what you do, no matter what you do to push them away, or think, yeah, I'll do them later, they still persist and they gnaw at you. What do you do with that? Well, as I see it, there are two possibilities. One, you can fight it, or two, you can go with it. The thing is, if you fight it, you're fighting yourself. And if you fight yourself, you know who loses. So why not go with it? 
But in order to do that, you've got to make time. You've got to have time to uh, have the energy to actually do something with that. So the thing is, we're all born at some point, and we're all going to die at some point. Every single one of you and me, we are all going to die. So between being born and dying, we have some amount of little bit of precious time. What are you going to do with that time? It is totally up to you and you alone how to choose what to do with your time. So why not choose well? Choice is a very powerful thing. We actually have no control over our lives, none. Life happens, and as John Lennon is attributed to saying, life is what happens when we're busy making other plans. But the thing is, we have no control over our lives, no matter how much we plan. We don't control, we have no control over what we feel at all. We have very little control over what we think. But we do have a lot of control over what we choose to do, what we choose to do with our time. We can choose anything. So why not choose what we think, to the best of our ability, might make us have a possibility of a chance of having some fulfillment? You know, why not choose things that feel better, to the best of our ability, to bring us forward to have a happier life? And then, based on that, there are consequences. It might not make us happier, or it might. Or it might uh, help other people, or it might not. We don't know. We have no control over that once we make a choice. But as a result of that choice, we'll think and we'll feel. And that's really valuable information, because based on that information, we can make another choice, which will have consequences, which will think and feel as a result. And based on those, we can make more choices, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a process which is really easy to state but very difficult to actually do. But it's very rewarding. And that process, with life's inevitable ups and downs, is in itself, I believe, what makes life meaningful. That process in itself is what makes life fulfilling, if you choose to live it. But that is totally up to you. And what fulfillment is to you is totally up to you. We have to make our own choices. So the thing is, I do not want to tell you or anyone what to do and what not to do. What I would love, though, is for you to make your own choices based on your life of what you believe to the best of your ability will make your life better. So I'm going to give you three examples of, what, of three conscious choices that I made in my life that changed my life forever. This is the first one that I made for myself. Up until then, my self-esteem, my self-loathing was so great that I never believed that I could actually make a choice for myself. I always made choices based on what I thought other people wanted of me, which is kind of warped, because I don't have control over my life. I certainly don't know myself well. I certainly don't know what other people want. And this is a weird, twisted thing of what I think other people want of me. You know, that's kind of narcissistic when you think about it. People aren't even thinking about me. Um, but anyways, this is the first choice I made for me, and I made it while watching Gilligan's Island. <laughs> I watched Gilligan's Island every fucking day of my life, and every day of my life, I did not like it. <laughs> even as a five-year-old kid watching Gilligan's Island reruns, I th remember thinking to myself, I don't like this, why am I doing it? And I didn't have an answer, so I kept doing it. I was a little kid, um, but it went on for years and years and years. So the thing is, I was, you know, self-loathing, bullied at school, et cetera, et cetera, and um, I withdrew into TV, which made me more depressed because I wasn't actually practicing living. It does take practice. I wasn't practicing interacting with other people of my species, humans. Um, so I became worse and worse at it. I became less healthy because I was just sitting in front of a piece of furniture, um, and I wasn't doing anything useful. Uh, so I got more and more depressed and more and more overweight. And so I'd go to school and be more of a target, only to retreat into television again when I got home. That's called addiction. 
Yes, my name is Mitch Altman and I'm a TV addict. However, I am no longer a using TV addict. On that day, when I was watching Gilligan's Island for the last time, it struck me that I do not have to continue doing this. I unplugged the fucking TV. I took that and the other 49 TVs. Yeah, I had 50 of them. I've been a geek all my life and I used to fix them up. I took all my 50 TVs, I put them on the curb where they all disappeared over a number of days. And my life has been so much better ever since because I've had time and energy to actually explore what it might be in my life that I didn't hate because I didn't know what I loved. But I could explore what it might be that I didn't hate, which gave me some energy to explore what it might be that I might sort of like, which gave me enough energy to explore what I like a lot, which eventually led to finding all these things that I love. All you need to do is make conscious choices and they have consequences. Here's another one that was really important for me, which is why I love passing this one along too. So all my adult life up until TV Be Gone, I've been a consultant in electronics, spending all of my time and energy on uh, projects that were um, for companies that profited by it. There's nothing Excuse me, there's nothing at all wrong with profit, but the only reason that these projects existed was to make profit for this company that I was working for, or these companies that I worked for. And, you know, they were okay projects. I never worked on anything I didn't like. Um, you know, I would never work on military, things that hurt people, that's, that's me. Um, but they were innocuous and kind of cool at best. Um, but it made me enough money in a few months or even a few weeks to live the rest of the year without working, which was kind of cool, and that's why I kept doing it. But after well more than a decade of living a kind of cool life, I wanted more. So I ran an experiment on myself, which leads me to this conscious choice. Um, what would life be like, I thought, if I only did what I loved? So I saved up enough money to live a year and ran this experiment myself where I would only do what I love and laundry. And um, I had no idea how I was going to make money. How do you make money doing what you love only? You know, if any work came my way, consulting work that I thought was just totally awesome and I would jump up and down for joy at the thought of doing, I would certainly do it. There's nothing wrong with making money. We need money to make uh, uh, payments on our, our rent or whatever and uh, buy food and all sorts of other things. But um, no work like that came along. So I did what I knew I loved, which was a bunch of volunteer work. Uh, bicycle coalition, refurbishing computers, emotional support for people with HIV, and a whole bunch of other things, working with uh, 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 small theater groups, and on and on and on. There was a whole bunch of stuff that I'd been doing, and I was able to do more of it, because I had a whole year to do stuff I loved, and I loved doing that, so I did. Um, and I was also um, had all these projects that I'd thought about way long ago, years ago, that I did not have energy or time to do because I was working in electronics, and the last thing I wanted to do was play with electronics when I got home from working in electronics. So they languished. But one of the projects was TV Be Gone, and uh, just one of many, but it's the one that got on a roll, and it really took over and I started becoming totally driven. And all these friends that I've been telling about it for all these times started helping me because they thought it was a cool project. And we all did it for free. We didn't think we were gonna make money on it. I mean, it was just making a few for us. Um, but um, after I finally finished it, after it turned out that there were enough people who told me, hey, I want one of those, that I actually thought I could manufacture them and maybe break even or supplement my income or something. But I met one of uh, my acquaintances from the Bicycle Coalition who needed a final project for his journalism degree. He was about to graduate and needed to do a final project. So what was supposed to be a 15-minute interview going to Best Buy, uh, you know, where we'd turn on some TVs, he'd write it up, and then uh, turn it in to his uh, professor and graduate with a journalism degree. Well, it turned out that it was three and a half hours of going around San Francisco, where I live, turning off TVs everywhere and having a blast. He wrote up a fantastic story, pitched it to a couple places, and Wired.com said, oh, well, we need a little bit of padding at Tuesday at two in the morning, so yeah, okay. Um, so that, that determined the first day of sales for me, 
And uh, by noon that next day, uh, I spent all, I was up all night fixing up my website to be ready for that first day of sales for that, you know, the handful of people who might want to buy such a bizarre thing uh, by reading where.com. Um, so I got the credit card thing working with my friend Chris. And uh, uh, at five in the morning, we started getting orders immediately after we put the website live. It turned out there were people actually waiting for the website to go live. They just, what were they doing? Hitting the F5 key again and again and again until that screen that said coming soon went away? Yes, because at uh, 30 seconds after uh, we went live, we got our first order. And then it was happening uh, every minute thereafter, uh, one or two orders per minute. And I thought, surely there must be a bug. But no, it was people ordering TV Be Gones. And at noon, the website crashed from too much web, uh, web traffic. And my life has never been the same since. So um, this experiment actually uh, worked for me. Uh, the thing is, I am making a living on a project that I love. And I don't make much money with this. I barely make enough money to pay my rent and buy food. Because to sell 260,000 TV you need a lot of people helping. And uh, I pay them well because it's only fair and I get what's left and that's just barely enough to live my life. But that's awesome because I get enough money to live my life that I love. And that is my definition of success. And I would love to help every single one of you and anyone who wishes to do the same in your own unique geeky way. Um, so this is what community is for, because we can help each other do stuff like this. Um, thing is, right now, uh, the economy seems to be sort of going up a little bit. But um, if you know anything about what's to come, the credit default swaps and all these other things, the economy is not in good shape. Um, and uh, the bankers and the people at the head of the SEC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are not people who are doing this stuff because they love it. They're getting what they can before it all tanks so that they can you know, build their own little uh, gated community or something. Anyways, this is my opinion. It has nothing to do with anyone else. But um, in any, any case, there's huge areas of our country where there are people who are unemployed and have been for well over a year. And there are lots and lots of us who are underemployed. But this is an opportunity because we have time in our lives to explore what we love and to explore doing projects that we just think are incredibly awesome just to do them. And this has helped the open source community tremendously because there are all these amazingly talented people who have time to work on these projects. All these different open source projects, hardware, software, uh, to do cool stuff with free culture and to um, help at hackerspaces, which have been proliferating like crazy since uh, I started NoiseBridge uh, with the help of other people in 2007. Um, so um, this is an opportunity to see, you know, that cubicle job isn't secure, even though that's the mythology. So we don't even have to be laid off before we can make choices to do what we love. You can quit now. And I would encourage you to do so. And I am really, really good at talking people into quitting their jobs. So if you are one of those people, or if you ever find yourself as one of these people, 80% uh, who does not like their work, I have my contact information on these cards. Take one. Take more, pass them around. Uh, I only do it consensually, but if you want to be quit, uh, talked into quitting your job, I will poke you relentlessly if you give me permission. Okay. Um, I can also help with uh, how to run a small business, how to do uh, manufacturing, shipping, whatever. Life, uh, universe, uh, metaphysics, whatever. Contact me. All my information is on there. And it'll be on the last slide, too. Um, let's see. So. Um, you know, one of my things that's near and dear to me is hackerspaces. And hackerspaces uh, are one form of very powerful community that exists uh, on our planet now. And it's part of the whole huge free culture open source community. Um, that's, you know, a, a place where we can get together in actual physical space with living, breathing human beings not just the internet, which is a really, really important, powerful tool for us to use in many ways. 
Um, the internet is, is fantastic, but it's not a substitute for real community uh, with actual human beings. Um, because when we're with other people, as we are here in this conference, I mean, that's why we have conferences, is to have uh, interactions, real interactions with people, because surprising things happen when we make a choice to be with other people. Uh, things that we can't plan on, and that's why we do this stuff, and it, it strengthens community and more of this stuff proliferates. Um, so hackerspaces are physical spaces where very diverse people can get together to share, teach, and learn with one another. Uh, it's very inspiring to be at these places. And, um, you know, it, many hackerspaces like NoiseBridge, here's a picture of NoiseBridge, uh, an, a workshop I gave at uh, the early days of NoiseBridge in 2008. Um, and I've been doing these workshops every Monday when I'm in town since uh, 2007. Uh, and when I'm not in town, I'm going around the world doing them elsewhere. Uh, I love doing this, it's really cool. Um, but um, um, we have a full kitchen, and when people get together and eat, the community gets even stronger, and eating's great. Um, so the thing is, hackerspaces uh, really are part of a uh, growing movement. Here's a, uh, a picture from a hackerspace in Paris called Temp Lab. Uh, and this is a meeting of the OLPC, One Laptop Per Child group. Uh, this was in 2009, I think. Uh, and OLPC was still pretty popular there, and people are invited to come in and get uh, help with their laptops, or, and they even fix them for people for free. Um, so the, the thing is, uh, hackerspaces are all very diverse places. And, um, you know, I'm talking about hackerspaces here, but this is really about a uh, forming community of all sorts. So what I say about hackerspaces is applicable to starting all sorts of communities, even online communities. Um, so, um, but my thing is organizing community through hackerspaces, so that's what I'm talking about specifically here. But um, for hackerspaces, it is totally non-centralized, like the whole open source movement. Uh, it's just a whole bunch of people doing what they think is awesomely cool. And um, so each one is unique. And that's because each hacker is unique. Each geek is unique. Each of us is a unique, geeky person uh, who wants to express themselves in their own unique, geeky way. Um, but how you define hacker depends on who you ask. For me, like I said before, it's learning as much as you can about a subject, improving upon it, and then sharing it. For instance, I'm a hardware hacker, TV Be Gone is a hack. I saw TV the way it was, and the way it still is in many ways, um, but uh, I improved upon it by taking remote controls, learning as much as I could about remote controls, getting rid of all those stupid buttons that are totally irrelevant, like channel up and down and volume up and down, leaving the only important button, which is the off button, and then sharing it with the rest of the world and thus making the world a better place for other people to share. So uh, that's my idea of hacking. Um, and there's also a mischievous side to hacking. Uh, this is a photo that I took at the Chaos Communications Congress, an annual conference in uh, Berlin, Germany, every December um, at my first one, which uh, was the 23rd one, where I got this. Um, I met this person, and um, by the way, I kind of like him. I've been to everyone ever since. And if you ever get a chance, you should go out way out of your way to check it out. This is community that is so amazing. Uh, you know, uh, hardcore security people, hardware hacking people, people who hack with food, uh, um, uh, privacy issues, uh, people who do humor, whatever. It's just, it's, it's really awesome and it's very inspiring. So anyways, this guy has this cable that he was going around with. It's an ethernet cable. I don't know if you can see that. It's an ethernet cable with an AC plug on the end. And he said it was his solution for computers. It's a joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, Apple's uh, um, uh, repair department at work. So, um, you know, and the thing is, uh, we need to hack. 
this is even a, a, a meaningless question. We need to hack, we need to express ourselves through our creativity. Each and every one of us needs that because it's in our DNA. We would not have survived on the planet if we did not come up with tools. And the thing is, hackerspaces um, are places where we can share the knowledge of our tools as we've been doing for countless millennia, actually for millions of years, where we evolved as creatures, as animals, bopping around on our bizarre little planet where it has, sometimes has a hostile environment. We got together in community and uh, supported one another. And one of the important ways of supporting one another was by sharing what we learned about the tools we use. And um, just because we can go out and buy whatever we want or need now doesn't mean we don't have a deep inner need to express ourselves through our creativity. It doesn't have to be things for mere survival anymore because we can go out and buy stuff. But we still have this deep inner need. And we still have a deep inner need for community. Even introverted geeks like us, most of us are probably introverted geeks, um, need community. And it's so hard to find on our planet, which is why we create things like Flourish and other conferences and maker fairs and hackerspaces and all these other things we do. Um, hackerspaces bring these two powerful deep inner needs together, the need to express ourselves through creativity and the need for community. And that's why they, I believe they've proliferated from just a handful in 2007 to uh, uh, just about 900 uh, existing or forming on the planet now. So um, I just want to show um, a few projects that inspired me to do uh, this whole hackerspace thing because um, I think they're incredibly awesome. I'm a hardware hacker, so most of these are sort of hardware centric. But um, um, people have come up with all sorts of amazing projects that inspire other people and uh, hopefully the project you are doing that you think is awesome, you put it out in the world, it doesn't matter how many people it might uh, inspire, if just one more person is inspired to do something cool as a result, you are helping other people and making the world a better place, not just for you but for others around you, which is very gratifying. So um, this uh, project um, is one that got me to my first hacker conference when people first telling, started telling me about it after I did TV Be Gone. Um, oh yeah, and by the way, here's um, some uh, TV Be Gone propaganda. It's really fun, so feel free to take one. Um, and uh, yeah, let's see. Damn, I forgot my TV Beyond stickers. So uh, later. Anyways, this one, this project is a building. That picture, it's not a model. That's actually a building. In Germany, this is kind of odd for Americans, but in Germany, hackers are very well respected. Um, that's because the Chaos Computer Club that puts on these Chaos Communications Congresses uh, does so many cool things and they're very well respected. And this is the really bizarre thing for Americans. When a German politician doesn't know something, especially about tech, they ask someone for advice. <laughs> Imagine that. So they actually uh, quite often ask the Chaos Com uh, Computer Club people uh, you know, what they think about things. And their advice isn't always heeded, but at least they ask. And quite often it is taken into account. And uh, Chaos Computer Club at CCC, it's just this very loose organization, not really centralized, uh, very anarchistic, where people self-organize to make really cool stuff happen. So they asked the mayor of Berlin if they could have this building, which is across the street from uh, where the Chaos Congress happens every December. And they said yes. Each window, it's Bauhaus, each window is square glass. They put a light in it and they hooked it up to a central computer system and they did some really simple software, put it up online, open source of course, and um, it just would do things like put a heart on the building. So it's a big display. And, but it's open source and they invited people to hack on it and one thing leads to another to another and eventually it turned into a thing, a project where the first two people who called in on their cell phones could play Pong on the building. I think that's great. So that, that got me to go to um, 
my first hacker conference is these people. And the subset of people who made this happen, there were a lot of blinking lights projects, and collectively they call, them, they call themselves Der Blinken Lights. So they did this other project. This one is a full-colored, um, low-res, three-dimensional cube. They call the Borg Cube. Came out of Das Labor Hackerspace in Germany. And that just goes on for hours. It's really awesome. Um, here I don't have a video, which is too bad, but uh, this was a piece of garbage um, that was uh, given to HackLab.to in Toronto. And they turned it into this thing that does wild uh, flame-like graphics and other stuff. Um, here's one that I did as artist in residence in uh, Artist Hackerspace in Providence, Rhode Island, AS220. Uh, I didn't know what I would do as a final project, but this is what I ended up doing. Trippy RGB waves, which I later uh, turned into a kit to teach people how to make cool things with electronics, even if they've never made anything. Um, and did that at Noisebridge. Um, this is uh, in Vienna. There's an annual robotics conference called Robo Exotica. Um, it's a, a real robotics conference, but it's a conference of people who make robots that mix cocktails. And uh, you can't tell from uh, the picture, but that is way bigger than this stage. And that's a mojito mixer. And it works. <laughs> it makes the best mojitos ever. This uh, one with this uh, robot here uh, serves a, a beer to people who want it. Uh, it bops around with remote control, and that guy in the background has a remote control. This one over here is um, made entirely out of Legos because that guy makes robots out of Legos, and it mixes uh, cocktails of your choice. It's a lot of fun, and I don't even drink, and I had a blast there. Um, MakerBot is a, a 3D printer. Uh, it's just like printers that print out on paper, uh, same kind of concept, except you know you have an image on your screen and press the print button and it out, out comes the image on paper. This, you have a 3D model on your screen that you see. You press the print button and out comes a piece of plastic that's an actual model and physical that you can hold in your hands. Um, this is part of a, a bigger, bodacious uh, uh, project with an audacious goal uh, of a robot that can print itself out called RepRap. We're a long way away from that, but it can print out its own parts, uh, many of its own parts now. And at Noisebridge, we've got MakerBots um, that print out many parts that are better than the parts that it came with. And we keep improving it that way. But anyways, these people at NYC Resistor were making kits for RepRap, and they, they became popular, and they made more and more and more, and eventually they had a, whole, a kit for an entire 3D printer, and that's now uh, a company that supports many people doing what they love, MakerBot Industries. And uh, it's, it's really cool. Yeah, yeah, Pumping Station 1 brought one of these, and you can actually check it out uh, and see it for yourself. They, theirs cost $800. Before that, the uh, cheapest, um, when they first put this out, the cheapest 3D printer available cost $30,000. This is why they're doing well. Um, but you know, there's a lot of other realms too besides hardware. Um, uh, Corporations exist, uh, publicly traded ones especially, to make a profit only. And that means they're not there for the benefit of people who buy their products. They're not there for the benefit of their employees. They're not benefit for the community. They're not there for anything but profit. So they put out the best case scenario for all of their products and not any of the lesser qualities. So if they're not saying what's wrong, what are the downsides of their products, who will say? Hackers. You and me and everybody who sees the downsides, we can talk about this stuff and we can make it public. So uh, Jake, who I co-founded Noisebridge with, and Seth Schoen, who uh, cohort of uh, Chris here at EFF, uh, and a bunch of people at um, Princeton University uh, did the cold boot attack. They found that if you turn a computer off before it's ready, or even if it is off, um, the information in the RAM doesn't just instantly go away. The information persists there over time, and if you cool the memory down, it stays for up to hours. And even the information that does go away can be recreated with some clever software which they wrote. And then it turns out that if you have an encrypted disk, 
that the key is in RAM. Imagine that. Nobody knew until they made it public in a responsible way so that people know about the actual level of security that they get with the tools that they have. And by the way, this wasn't just Windows. This was Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. And on many of the most popular, all of the most popular uh, disk encryption software that was available at the time, some, but not all of this, has been fixed to date. Google that. Um, and this one I already talked about going around the world doing uh, uh, workshops. This is what I do at NoiseBridge every week. We call it Circuit Hacking Monday. And a lot of hackerspaces do this. And I'm going to be doing uh, one on the road here at Pumping Station 1 on Thursday. And I invite you all to do that. And I have a slide for that at the end. Um, uh, here's an incredible project as well. Uh, people at NoiseBridge thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could take a picture of the planet, like a snapshot? So uh, a handful of them got together, and in six weeks and $250, they got this photo. They sent a balloon up above the atmosphere and took this photo. $250 in six weeks. How long did it take NASA to get a photo like that? But of course, we learned a lot by NASA, because NASA actually puts most of their information out online where other people can learn from it. Um, but now this is hackerspaces all over the world and many other groups doing uh, these space balloon projects. And at NoiseBridge we have two groups. One's called SpaceBridge, and I can't remember the name of the other. This one is a Rube Goldberg machine by a hackerspace in Tokyo called Anchor Lab. That's how you pronounce that thing with the four, five, and six in it. Um, you press the button and something happens, a mechanical thing happens, which makes something happen on video, uh, which makes a sensor go, which makes the next thing happen, and one thing after another after another, and it just goes on and on. I speed up the video here, um, so it won't take you know, too much time. The video is really long, I just, just a snippet of it. Um, but I like this part with the paper, or the toilet paper and uh, the lights and the sensors and more stuff on video and more sensors being triggered and it just on and on and on. This, it, it's just the most pointless and beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. And they just did it because they love it. These people, if you're ever in Tokyo, uh, visit these people. They're, they're amazing. They do great stuff with sound and music as well. Uh, and actually, wherever you go in the world, you can look on hackerspaces.org. I'll have that link in my last slide. Um, and look up hackerspaces. Like I said, there's like 900 of them. Just go there. You know, whatever your realm is, whether it's hacking food or the planet or software or hardware or music, you will make friends instantly by going to a hackerspace wherever you go. Um, it's great community. So, um, yeah, so I think I've already answered that question. We need community. We need to have a community and express ourselves uh, through our creativity. And it makes our lives better and helps people around us, which makes the world better. And the thing is, community doesn't just happen. People make it happen. So if you think forming community is cool, you can, you can just go to community that already exists, and that's fantastic because you're supporting community that way. But if there's a community that you would like to see that doesn't exist, do it. <laughs> you are the kind of person that will make it happen because you're a person. We all make community. That's part of our brains. It's part of our DNA. It only happens when people make it. Me and my friend Jake were at a Chaos Congress where we were inspired to uh, make a, a hackerspace. And that's the way all hackerspaces have started. That's the way all open source projects have started. Um, it's from people like us doing it. And the way to do it, any community, a hackerspace or whatever, is to put the word out. Become the person who won't shut up about how cool the thing that you envision is. The enthusiasm is incredibly contagious. Um, make a website. Uh, make stickers. Here's noise bridge stickers. People love stickers. I'm a bit overboard in mine, but I'm not alone in that. Um, hackerspaces as well, as, you know, most hackerspaces make small stickers because uh, these are perfectly sized for covering certain corporate logos. And uh, these bigger ones are perfectly sized for covering other corporate logos. 
take one if you like. Um, they're perfect for laptops and uh, skateboards and tobus and street lamps and whatever. Spread the joy. So, um, but yeah, just put out the word any way you can. Email lists and uh, just talk, talk, talk. Parties, whatever. And do projects. Meet cool people. Envision the culture that you want to be a part of every day of your life. What, will, what is that culture like? You're the one starting the community, so put the word out about that culture. It'll attract more people that fit into that culture. And that culture is reinforced and grows, which attracts more people that fit into that culture, et cetera, et cetera. And that is community. So also, if you're doing a hackerspace, you need to have a space. Some of them actually around the world, it's kind of hard in the US, but it's not so hard in places like Detroit, uh, where you can get a place either really cheap or free and squat. But there are other places around the world that actually squat. Uh, other ones, um, you know, they get enough money and uh, they can pay rent and appease a landlord um, and make the landlord happy. Um, and you can get donations and grants, uh, which is easier if you're a nonprofit. Um, and as far as organization goes, there's so many ways of doing all that. You can be um, totally open. You can have invite-only membership, um, consensus run, or uh, majority rule. All these different ways. It can be hierarchical with a benevolent dictator at the top, or it can be totally egalitarian. Whatever fits into the culture that you want is the way to go about it. It can be nonprofit or for-profit. It doesn't matter. What matters is what you want with the community you're forming. And also with rules, it can be with lots of detailed rules so everyone knows what to expect, or it can be totally open-ended so um, you know the more anarchist types are comfortable. Whatever you want in the culture you're envisioning is the way to go. So for example, Noisebridge is the one I started. Here's the way we work. We're incredibly diverse. Noisebridge, by the way, was started by anarchist, uh, hippie, weirdo, punk types, me and my friend Jake. And so we wanted to start an anarchist, hippie, weirdo, punk kind of an environment, so we did. And that's the environment that thrives there to this day. And to have that kind of environment, it needs to be diverse. So we, you know, I'm hardware, Jake is software, um, but we have people into craft and art and music and uh, science and biology and food and photography and video and on and on and on and on and on. Because that's the kind of culture that uh, it attracts. Um, we are radically open. And by that we mean everyone is always welcome at Noisebridge. You can use anything at Noisebridge. It's a community resource for everyone. Um, you don't have to be a member to teach a class. You don't have to be a member to take a class. You don't have to be a member to use any of our tools, our soldering irons, our drill press, our laser cutter, uh, the sewing machines, the kitchen. You, can, uh, you don't even need to be a member to have a key for Noisebridge. If you ever think you are going to be in San Francisco and want to visit Noisebridge, Please take a key. You are welcome at Noisebridge. <laughs> and I really do mean that. You are totally always welcome at Noisebridge. Really do take a key if you think you will ever want to visit. Um, we have no leaders and only one rule. Our one rule is be excellent to each other, from which all else follows. So. Um, not everyone feels comfortable in this environment. Everyone is always welcome at Noisebridge, but that doesn't mean everyone's going to be uh, wanting to stay. And that's totally fine. When you start community, it's open to everyone, maybe, but it's not for everyone, and that is totally OK. But in my view, the more open you are, the more cool people you'll attract. And if people go away, they can do something else cool. If they stay, then they're supporting your community and helping you themselves and the world around. So everybody wins. Here's a couple other examples. Uh, Metalab in Vienna is one of the oldest of these new wave of hackerspaces now. They've been around about six years. Uh, they're very diverse as well. They're pretty open also. Um, I learned a lot about how I want to do Noisebridge from uh, going to Metalab in Vienna. Um, but, uh, oh yeah, uh, Noisebridge is funded by membership and donations primarily. 
We also sell t-shirts for donation like this and drinks and uh, a few other things. Uh, but primarily from membership and donation. Uh, same with uh, Metal Labs, but they also are lucky enough to be in Vienna where the city gives them free rent. And uh, yeah, they actually support the arts in places outside of the United States. Um, so they also have a kitchen where people share meals, like, like Noise Bridge. It's a very social environment, and um, it's totally open-ended. There's no projects uh, created by Meta Lab. There are only projects done by people in Meta Lab, like Noise Bridge. Uh, but uh, for Meta Lab, you have to be there with a member. Um, and I opened that up more uh, with the help of everyone else at Noisebridge. Um, NYC Resistor at the bottom is primarily electronics and craft. They're a lot smaller. They, they limit their membership size. They're also for profit because it was easier to get the corporation. All they had to do was fill out a form, whereas at Noisebridge we're nonprofit and it took us a year to do that. We thought it was worth it. They thought it was worth it just to get going. Um, but they don't make a profit because then they'd have to pay taxes and of course we all know where that money goes. So, um, but yeah, and they were way into rapid prototyping with 3D printers and stuff like that. Uh, here's another cool space right here in this fair town of ours. Uh, Pumping Station 1 um, is a couple years old and they just doubled their physical size recently. They're still moving into the other space. Um, it's also nonprofit, part of a, a umbrella with uh, a group called School Factory that has a whole bunch of hacker spaces and schools, uh, alternative schools. Uh, they're uh, pretty diverse, but at the moment they're mostly software, but that's just because of the way the membership's going. Democratically run rather than consensus. Um, and again, member finance, but they also charge a little bit for their classes to keep their doors open. Although the workshop on Thursday that I'll be giving is free. Um, so um, if you want to start community, you are not on your own. All these communities, open source, open uh, software and hardware and hacker spaces, we all support one another. So uh, there is this uh, organization, hackerspaces.org, that's actually the website as well which um, uh, was started by people at Meta Lab, and I also help there. Um, there's weekly call-ins, there's an email list, there's uh, a lot of resources on that website about how to do community in general and hackerspaces in particular. So um, the hackerspace design patterns is there, and that's 25 years of experience of what's worked and what has not worked at hackerspaces for a quarter century in Germany. And it's not saying what to do and what not to do, but it is saying, what has worked and not worked for these hackerspaces. So it's fine to violate any of the patterns, but do so consciously. And a lot of stuff in there is really good for running your own small business as well. It's a fantastic resource. Uh, please check that out. And um, another thing too about uh, uh, media, it's because of the mainstream media that the word hacker means what it does to most people in the world. Most people in the world, they hear the word hacker and they think, oh, people who break into computers and do illegal activities. That's because in the late 80s and early 90s, that's what the mainstream used as a word to put on people who are starting to do that. Um, but what the mainstream media is seeing now, which is kind of ironic, is like, oh, you think that hacker means this. Well, in actuality, it means this. You're wrong. And so that's the story now. So it's been proliferating like crazy because of all the cool things coming out of hackers and hackerspaces. And those are links to just two really nice articles about Noisebridge uh, and other hackerspaces. And I'll put in a plug here also for Chaos Camp. Um, this is the most inspirational uh, set of experiences I've ever had in my entire life. Because of that, I started Noisebridge with the help of other people. Because of this, I go around the planet teaching people to solder and doing more of what I love and encouraging others to do the same. Uh, that was, camp happens every four years. The next one is in August in a small ex-Soviet military airport called Finafort. It's totally crazy. There's old MiG fighters laying around and stuff. It's so ugly, it's obscene, and yet it's transformed by the hackers that go there into the most magical fairyland with lasers and lights and music and uh, you name it. It's, it's really beautiful. So uh, check that out, uh, Chaos Camp 2011. 
Um, and I'll just put in also a plug here for um, the workshop happening Thursday. There's the address at Pumping Station 1. Um, it really is a lot of fun. Anyone can learn to solder. I've personally taught 20,000 people or more to solder. Anyone can learn, age four and up. So um, that's the end of my rant, basically. But I just want to uh, really encourage everyone to um, you know, choose well what you do with the time of your life and uh, make your life better and the world becomes better. So thanks. Thank you.